Hey guys, sorry for we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but hi yeah, everyone, uh, and <laughs> welcome to this new wedding for. Uh, I'm Navya M, and I'll be your host for this session. Uh, I hope you all are having a great time at this new so far, and we are glad you could join us today. Um, so everyone is talking about AI. Every industry wants a piece of this AI pie. Uh, but what does it mean uh, to testers? How can you utilize AI to help you in your career? To answer these questions, we have today with us Jason Avan. His talk, AI in Testing, Strategies for Promotion and Career Success, is going to give you all insights on how AI can help you. Jason is CEO of Checky.ai. He has worked on major projects at Google, Bing, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Windows C, and Chrome OS. He has co-authored two books, How Google Tests Software and App Quality, Secrets for Agile App Teams. Do check it out. Uh, in his talk, Jason will discuss how AI can be a powerful tool in software testing. He will explain how testers can gain respect and promotions by focusing on fast, efficient, and creative testing. So get ready to learn how to fast track your career with the power of AI. I now welcome Jason Arban to take over the session. Stage is all yours, Jason. Cool. Thanks, Navya. Yeah, actually, it's just fun. Maybe just hang out in the chat session. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, let's get started. Um, yes. So yeah, like you said, there's a lot of talk about about AI today in software testing, and I think you know a lot of people are talking about the mechanics of it, like how do you get it to work, like how do you do prompt engineering, these kind of things. Um, but I, I thought it'd be worth um, everybody's time to talk about you know how it can make your you know, even some people are worried about it, right? But the question is, like, how do you leverage it to make your career better? How to get promoted? How to, uh, you know, increase job security um, using AI? Um, so one, so like the question is like, why would I talk about this? Is I've had some experience at um, quite a broad range of experience. I like to say my dad, my dad usually said that I, I, um, I like to quit. <laughs> That's how you're going to move around a lot. Um, but I've been, I've worked at a lot of companies, some of the largest companies in the world down to, you know, medium SMBs and, and, uh, and startups too. Um, and then also, but I've had also different roles, at all those different companies. So I've been promoted, I've promoted a lot of people and seen a lot of people promoted. And interestingly, I've seen a lot of people that weren't promoted. Um, and so kind of look at those kind of patterns. And then to add to what I've worked at, um, quite a few companies focused on, on software testing too, uh, at different you know, different aspects. So I think I have a pretty good triangulation on kind of this promotion in the, um, in the testing world. I just want to share some insights and thoughts I've had. Primarily as I look at, I look at all the LinkedIn posts and people are, are either losing jobs, looking for jobs, or worried about AI, or um, super enthusiastic about AI. I wanted to share like the longer form thoughts on this. Um, so this is quick context for the rest of the stuff we're going to talk about. I just recorded this like last night for fun. Um, but you can look at the, on the right-hand side, what you see is um, a set of testers, these little profiles of these um, testers. Each one has a different specialty, right? Like this one is mobile, um, but there's also like, you know, performance, um, you know, uh, functionality, security, accessibility, privacy, all sorts of different types of testing and different test bots. So I kind of call it the AI test team. But you'll see, you'll see why. I just want to make sure people feel like it's real and understand that there's um, this isn't just speculation of what's going to happen in, in the next you know five years. This is this is starting to happen today. So a couple of things about career strategy. Um, I think one of the basic things to think about is job security. <laughs> That's number one. Like keeping your job and staying employed is probably the the you know Maslow's like lower layer of, of career strategy. You've got to solve that first. Um, and when things are changing quickly, it's something you probably need to proactively think about and directly um, uh, address. They're also, so in promotion, so in career, either you're going to stay where you are, and that, some people are fine with that. Most people would like a promotion. Um, usually people like myself get promoted beyond their abilities. <laughs> um, but um, but we talk about promotion too, specifically. And then also, even after you get promoted, um, you need to stay relevant. Um, and AI is accelerating and it's a weird thing it's not just like revolutions of mobile and and cloud and all this stuff the weird thing is that the ai can um actually speed up the development of ai itself so we need to expect that there's going to be more and more change it's not like next year we go okay lms are done gen ai is done um and we just coast for another four or five years uh, we've got to keep staying relevant 
So the good news is, and actually it's fun to see already some other folks talking on the conference today about this, is that almost as if it's obvious, but I wasn't sure that it was obvious myself, but there's going to be a lot more demand for testing. Uh, and that's because, um, you know, AI is helping developers write code and you're starting to see this summer, the emergence of, um, and Microsoft's working on this themselves, um, the ability for AI to work and build code without people in the loop, um, or they're only in the loop at the very end or the very beginning. So what that means is that you don't have to wait for a software engineer to write the code or a product manager to, to, to create the uh, design or the feature, feature requests or, or spec. Um, AI can start working without humans. And that means there's gonna be, you know, tons more product to be tested, tons more APIs, tons more infrastructure that, that all needs to be tested. Uh, so there's gonna be a big bottleneck. There's a bottleneck today, testing can't keep up, but that bottleneck is gonna be getting higher and higher. That dam is gonna be um, uh, hopefully not overflowing soon. And it's actually one of the biggest um, concerns that CIOs have um, in the world today uh, is they can, they're using Gen AI, they can build a bunch of stuff, but they can't test it. They need to test it before they can release it to their customers and they're worried about that. So they may have like a bunch of value to bring to the company, but they can't get it into production without a lot of testing. Um, also, there's gonna be a lot of disruption to organizations. So this is really critical. If you think about the last, like every, every, almost every promotion I had in life was either because I changed companies or uh, because of a disruption, right? Whether it's mobile, um, cloud, um, like these types of things cause disruptions in the industry, but that means that there's new job openings. That means that even within a company, you know, there's going to be a new AI team at a lot of companies, right? There's going to be new features that are AI only. And that's a great place for testers to, to move into. It creates open slots, right? It also, the disruption might get rid of some of dead wood, people that aren't interested in, in adopting new technologies um, or, or perceptive, perceptively slowing the organization down. Um, so you don't have to wait you know, anymore for your manager to, to retire or die. Um, you, can, um, you can move into new slots when there's a lot of disruption going on. And then lastly, we all know AI is accessible now. Like my last company, we spent, I don't know, <laughs> untold amount of time and treasure um, labeling, you know, buttons in cafes, labeling, labeling search boxes, thousands of them, taking screenshots of those. And then also like, you know, doing reinforcement learning by hand uh, with Python and stuff it was brutal. Uh, but now everyone, you know, even my kids can go in and use um, AI. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity for people to jump in and, and, uh, and, and add a ton of value to the company and to themselves. So disruptions here, a lot of testers, probably not the ones that are here or especially listening to this talk right now, but a lot of testers, um, you know, have always complained about automation and code and stuff is, you know, it's not smart. It only does the same thing over and over again. Um, it's just checking, they call it, which is why I called my stuff checking. Um, but, um, but the reality is, is that Gen AI is different. Gen AI, Gen AI's whole purpose in life is to emulate humans. Like, like even with smart, not smart, <laughs> like mean, rude, polite, um, it tries to emulate all of them. And so it's the first time that we've seen software just emulating humans. And that's something that we used to think as testers was uniquely the human aspect, right? That's like, oh, we'll always have human testers because only we can emulate the users and understand and empathize with them, right? But if you look into it, the AI does a pretty darn good job about it. So let's talk about some job security. Again, that base level uh, of things for a sec. One is, and you've seen it, like, you know, I've been saying this for a few years and, and you know, yeah, okay, Jason, you know, you're, you're living in a future that may appear. Um, it's here, half, you know, it feels like half the conference talks are about AI um, these days and in just the last six months. Um, and, you know, I'm used to when there was, there was only one and it was me and no one would show up. Um, but AI is gonna be expected. You're gonna be using AI and, and awareness of, of AI is gonna just be, it's gonna be table stakes for software testing um, in, the, um, in the very near future, if not today in a lot of organizations. Like you just look like you're flat footed or not, you know, not on the ball and, and realize it's a technology industry, right? Like if you're, if you're not following the latest tech in a tech industry, it's probably not a good sign either, either that not a good sign for your personal career growth or for your career in the sense you're working at a company that is probably maybe not going to last very long or there's not going to be a lot of new opportunities because they're, are just turning the crank and, and not innovating. The high level thing, if you want to like go off to another session <laughs> is if you want to take the, the net takeaway is that 
for job security and kind of how this is going to happen over the next you know while is testers are going to become mini managers. Um, they'll be managing those sets of um, uh, of AI bots. The little AI bots are like little tiny employees or little intern robots. Um, the, the normal individual tester, instead of testing and reporting on their own work, will be letting half their testing might be done by automated robots, and they'll have to report on all that test. They'll be mini managers or soon managers. Test automators have the most actually disruptive, this would be the most disruptive thing for them, um, but they need to move um, need to move into complex testing. Um, and at least, not just even in reality, but in, in term, terms of perception. Most managers have seen and tried it themselves, uh, use ChatGPT to just generate Selenium code, right? Like that's not a magic thing anymore. It's not impressive to anybody anymore. It's like, the question is like, why do I have this person doing it instead of the machine? So um, we'll talk more about, about that in detail. And also managers, um, you know, managers will need to, and managers, directors, senior directors, senior level three directors, executive directors, all these folks will need to increase their scope because um, we'll, we'll talk about that. They need to increase their scope. You, if you're testing one app, you need to test more apps. If you um, think about testing more apps at a time, if you're testing like a particular platform like web, you need to think about also only maybe mobile or, or other platforms, but you need to broaden your scope. Um, and then lastly, that's a little side note, but I think there'll be a lot of downward pressure on external vendors. Um, and so full-time staff at a, at, a, at a larger company or at a large testing vendor will, will be fine. They can benefit from all this stuff, but the smaller contractor um, folks um, will start to be feeling left out of the loop. Um, so I actually suggest for career stuff that people in those kind of roles, the ad hoc, smaller company stuff, move into a larger organization because AI will, centralize and concentrate a lot of this um, value and they will get a lot more benefit from the reuse of AI. So, um, so they'll benefit much more than the, than the smaller companies. The rich get richer kind of a, a thought and more, and more secure for jobs. So there's really two, two branches here um, of there's, there's AI, broadly speaking, there's, there's the activities and jobs that are testing AI. So people that are actually testing LMs or testing uh, like, you know, AI based features of an existing product. And then there's the other side, which is people using AI to do software testing, right? To do either to test, you know, any kind of software. Um, and so, um, so it's interesting to know that there's, there's two branches. I want to hit first on the testing AI based systems. Um, and, and these are the things that people need to need to know for, for not just job security, but also promotion. Uh, and like, It'd be ideal if you knew that now, <laughs> but I would highly recommend people learn these things first uh, and as soon as possible. And partly it's it's also, if I can add, it's, um, uh, I've been through this transition myself um, because I, when I was working at Microsoft, they used to work on Windows related stuff. And then I moved to Bing and Bing was totally an AI first neural network first um, search engine for ranking. And so, like I've been through this transition from traditional testing to, to AI based testing. Um, and these are the things that I wish I could have told myself back then. Um, my much younger, handsomer um, self is uh, are, are these things. And I had to kind of learn them on the fly and learn that my old stuff didn't work. Um, so one, one of these things here is, um, is to be a chat GPT expert, like really be an expert in that, in the AI. And it sounds funny, but there's this like Dunning Kruger effect a lot where well, first of all, a lot of testers don't want it to work. So they just kind of ask simple questions and then say it's not useful. Um, those people won't, probably won't get promoted. The plight we all say, they're probably not on the list to, hot list to get promoted. Um, but, but you need to be an expert in it because it's, it's basically quickly becoming table stakes and people will assume that you have access and can, and can understand and leverage these systems. The biggest issue that's, and the biggest advantage that's happened in the last six months is these, these, they have there's large context windows now. You used to be able to complain, oh, the AI can't understand my business. It can't understand, um, doesn't understand, you know, my code base, or my product, when I ask a question. And that's not true anymore. So if you look at it, this is Claude. I don't know if people use Claude. It's actually my current go-to uh, versus ChatGPT. It's just far better at, at a lot of things, um, anecdotally. Um, and by a lot of the metrics, but, but definitely anecdotally. 
So because what you can do, these little these little boxes at the bottom under the chat on the chat box, you can just drag and drop any document you want on there. It could be, you know, your business, the business plan, it could be the test plans, it could be the requirements. You can put the entire code base in there. Even if you're a manual tester and you don't know how to code, you can't even read code, you can copy paste the code from your product into it. You shouldn't on public ones. That's a disclaimer, I guess. But with LMs, you can drop that code in there and then you can ask any question you want. And the more context you give it, the better it is. And more importantly, what testers, I think, and generally don't realize is that, um, is that even if you, most testers haven't read the code base, they also don't usually have the business plan. Um, and sometimes they remember the requirements. Um, but the AI, when you ask a question, it, it can remember all of those and, and correlate and, um, ideas across all these corpus, right? All these corpora. So it can, it can actually, it's as if it read and analyzed every single document and kept it all in memory, in active memory, and then answered your question, which is better than, I mean, I, I can't do that. Um, another thing to do, this may seem simple, but it's a huge, huge different inflection point. Especially in testers I see that are struggling with this is that they, they do it backwards. They assume that they're the really smart, um, super experienced person. And they ask the AI small questions if it's an intern. People, people call it like, you know, treat it like an intern. If you're interacting with it though, the reality is it's an expert in far more areas than you are. It can pass even the IST, QB, whatever, um, all those set of uh, standardized, you know, training classes and certifications. I've done it. It, it can answer, it, it does a better job than me on them. <laughs> totally. Um, so it's actually an expert, um, you, but that means you should talk to it differently. You're, your job is to get a great answer to make your job better, right? And to make you look smarter and more efficient. Um, but so don't ask it the small questions. Ask it the big, hard questions and follow-up questions. Um, if, if you're not, if it's not, you don't find ChatGPT useful, it's you're 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 using it wrong. Um, so one thing I have to note too is testers and specifically always have this angst um, around um, hallucinations, like oh the AI not is it not just not predictable sometimes, but you know oh you know, I can't use it for testing or in general because it'll make stuff up. Well, the funny thing is if you just realize that the, the chatbot is has to give you an answer, like that's, it's trained, it's built to do that. So if you ask a silly question, it will give you a silly answer. Um, even if you ask a serious question, you don't know how to tell if it's hallucinating or not. Um, you can just ask it to give a confidence score. You can say, hey, just like you would another person. If you ask a person randomly on the street, ChatGPT is like this. Walk up to a random person on the street and you ask them a question. Well, A, they need context to, or, or you, if you don't share them the context, then you probably get a weird answer. But more importantly, you can say, hey, how confident are you in the answer? A lot of testers will take the answer and just be like, oh, it's wrong and it's, it's stupid or whatever. But if you ask it and say like, what's your confidence? It might go like, um, I'm a one out of 10. And you can even ask it like, why do you think that? And we'll say like, well, I haven't found any information on the internet about this, but I'm speculating that this might be the case. And uh, but I have a low confidence in it. So that's a, a super big secret. Um, and it might help people, build people's confidence in terms of using these systems in their testing. I do this all the time. Every, by the way, every API call I make, I, when I get JSON back, I have a confidence score in the JSON. I don't know why this isn't built into the LM yet or interfaces or why people don't do it, but uh, it's pretty amazing. So you can just ignore anything less than say five out of 10 or something, just filter it, just ignore. Um, yeah, so this is something people probably don't want to hear. Um, I don't know why I made that distribution so small. Um, but, and people aren't gonna like it, but you just need a basic level understanding of statistics and sampling. Um, the reason is in old school, this is, if there's one thing to take away from this whole thing, it's this, you gotta change to get promoted, to add value and, and progress in this world with AI. Um, you need to think about input and output in terms of sets of data. Like usually testers think one test at a time. In fact, the ideal test case is an atomic independent test, right? With one piece of input data, or one piece of output data, and it's hopefully very predictable and reliable. But that's totally wrong when you're talking about um, AI. AI is good, but only in bulk, right? You pass in, um, you know, a thousand different inputs and you get a thousand different outputs and you kind of compute the average um, or mean of, of the, the usefulness of those outputs. Any individual ad hoc kind of anecdotal data is, is useless. 
one is you really can't fix it. It's very difficult to go back and fix the AI, um, even if it when if when and where it is wrong. But really, it's about it's like a search engine. You know, it's it's um, you know, how do you know what the exact right link is? You don't know that, and you just know on you need to know on average that the links are in the good links are there and they're in the right spots, relatively speaking. Um, so if any tester or you find yourself talking about, hey, I gave this input or prompt and I got this answer and it's wrong or it's good, um, you're you're doing it wrong. It needs to be done. Not talking in terms of large number of inputs and outputs. Um, you're 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 not doing the transition yet from from traditional to, to kind of modern modern testing. This is a little geeky, but um, there'll be like two people who'll benefit from this. But if you really want to measure quality of these types of systems and AIs, the, the best way to place to look is how people tested search engines. Um, this is how Google and Bing test it. Like. But they can actually get a measurement. You can get a number for how good the engine is, uh, or good the AI is. But there's, you know, there's techniques. Like basically, the best one to, the, the baby one to think about is called uh, um, DCG, which is called discounted cumulative gain. It's a very simple formula. Like you can just plug into Python, and there's probably libraries with it. Um, but but if you really want to be able to test AI intelligently, and you're not doing this, you're not familiar with this. I guarantee you're, you're probably doing it doing it wrong and probably won't get promoted. Um, AI is also meaning that we need to focus a lot more on deep critical thinking. I, I'm actually glad to see a lot of people thinking the same, uh, uh, but I'm not talking about usual suspects of like that preach critical thinking or if someone usually claims they're a critical thinker on LinkedIn, they're probably not, um, and you can usually tell. Um, but I'm by deep, meaning like, like really question the system, like understand, all these different biases um, and uh, that are in the system. But actually, the way to think about it is this, you need to really understand the biases in um, the AI, right? Everyone should be focusing on that because there's biases in the training set. Every AI is biased, the question is just how it's biased. Um, but then crazier, you need to think about the, the bias of other people too. So people talking about these things, where are they coming from? Why are they saying what they're saying? Um, especially in the world of marketing and AI, um, really, you know, think critically about, you know, is that useful? Does it actually work? Is it actually AI? But more importantly, think about um, yourself. Like the biggest problem I think testers have is they don't, the better they are at critical, crit criticizing other things, the less they are at criticizing themselves and critiquing themselves. I don't mean being negative, but I mean being critical. Like, you know, what am I good at? What am I bad at? What are my, what are my biases? So I highly recommend people think about their own biases, especially in this transition. People also should know how it works. And uh, kind of said before that you don't need to, but I think I think you do because there's so many mis mistakes being made. Um, uh, but really you don't have to understand it at a mathematical level or build your own LLM. But I really advise people to watch a fair amount of YouTube and, and, and just even this visualization, I think is pretty good. It gives you an idea of how the thing works because if you don't know how it works, you really don't know how to test it. Um, and with classical procedural code, Java, Python, whatever, uh, C++, you could actually kind of ignore the implementation, like do black box testing. But AI lends itself to so many troubles if you just do black box testing. A quick example is this. You'll see people bring this up. I mean, even the last session, somebody brought this up. How many letters are, are how many letter R's are there in the word strawberry? And ha ha, the AI, you know, it can pass all these, <laughs> these exams. Um, get a higher, uh, you know, SAT score and higher on the testing uh, quizzes um, and certifications than they than the tester could, but they they like to find errors and problems. The reality is that it's a it's a horrible question <laughs> to ask the LLM if you knew how they're built. If you look at this color coded thing, that's how an LLM looks at text. It doesn't read the letters individually one at a time. It also doesn't necessarily read all the words one at a time. It can read parts of words, breaks up some, the way to think about it generally is it looks at syllables, right? And then if two of them are close together and occur frequently, maybe that's a word, it's more of a, it's a concept. So asking it to do spelling is kind of a, a silly question. Um, and it reveals just more about the person asking the question than it does the system. Um, so if you, but if you're saying things like this on, on social media, you're saying these things at work um, and you're poking fun of, of an AI and guess what the engineers are doing? or the people that know what's going on. They're saying, oh, this person doesn't understand it. Not only do they not understand it, they don't wanna know it and, and they're mocking it. That's not a very constructive environment um, and they're probably not gonna help help the team. 
So it can be very limiting in terms of, of promotion and, and job security to be doing this type of thing. I highly recommend people understand how they work and make sure they use that context in, in their testing and in, in their critique. So now let's talk about in generally like how, how are we gonna apply AI to software testing, uh, how to test with AI, but particularly how it affects all these people's careers, right? Um, so manual testers and exploratory testers. And by the way, if people want to argue with that definition, that's probably another anti-pattern. <laughs> um, if you don't understand what I mean, it's fine. I don't care. Uh, you enjoy your definition of it. But if you kind of know what I'm talking about, <laughs> follow along. The the uh, So really, like I, I showed you earlier, the manual testers like today, they're clicking, they're checking sign-in, they're... they're they're um, uh, testing, you know, different features of the product, exploring, exploring it, looking for problems or proof that it's, or evidence that it's working well. But they're going to be manager of AI bots because the AI bots will actually do some of the basic work for them. And by the way, a lot more, but it needs to be reviewed, right? Because a human, until the, if, if we ever reach a problem, if anyone tells you the AI doesn't need review, that means the end of the world is coming because then the AIs don't need us. Um, so we should plan for career wise that they need us for a little while. Um, but the, so the, the IC line level tester, usually executing a list of test cases out of a test case management system, um, or exploratory testing all day, or some exploratory testers just learn the product and think all day and never file a bug. I should behave. Um, <laughs> but so these managers of the AI, they will be managers of AI bot teams. Um, so they need to think a little bit more about analyzing things, work that's not theirs. And they also need to have a broader perspective. We'll look at that in a second. Um, good news, they'll have time to think finally. Like a lot of people claim to be testers, but really they're just checking all day. They're just doing rote work over and over again. They're not really testing, not using their brain that much. Uh, but with AI bots finally doing some of the basic stuff um, that automation promised to do and never really did that, did a great job of. Um, uh, it'll give people time to think and actually do some deep testing. And like I said, they'll, they'll move from that validation perspective into more like actual testing work. Um, also, they need to focus on being visible. And the reason I say this is that when the management is looking at management and testing and outside of testing looks at software testing, they go like, oh, well, it's just making sure the thing works. Like, can't AI do that? Like, that seems actually simple. They don't realize it's actually probably the hardest problem because um, of the Oracle problem. But um, but you need to be visible, like focus on being visible. Like it used to be just, hey, you did your job, you, you logged your pass fails and you can file the bug or two and you're going with your day. Now you need to make sure you're visible. The people know that you're better than the AI, that you're adding value the AI can't deliver and that you're using that AI to deliver your value. Um, like if you don't, people assume pretty much that you're not. So a key change here is a quick view. So this is real data. I like to always talk with real data instead of just broad assertions. Um, so look, if you look here, like, you know, this is me clicking, um, but this is where the future of, of manual and exploratory testing is, is that the AI has gone out, done a bunch of testing on this web page, found some possible issues, right? That's why they're orange, not red. Um, and, but all sorts of issues, all sorts of different types of issues. But the tester needs to go in and say, good robot, good robot, dumb robot, um, and so on, right? To, to double check and review it. Because sometimes they'll say things that are wrong. Sometimes they'll say things that are awesome. <laughs> um, but the idea is that it will test hundreds of pages for thousands of types of issues. And the, the human will turn into a rating, rating machine where they go thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, just to give you, a, it's super important to express this. You know, people think about testing the way they test it, right? And people are usually either a functional tester, or they focus on accessibility or their performance. The cool thing about AI in its disruptive aspect is that it's good at all of these things, right? Usually the functional engineer only sees the functional test as value. The performance person only sees the performance value of, of a GPT. But if you can orchestrate it right, you can get the value of all of these different aspects of testing from the bot. So that manual tester that just used to... Um, uh, test uh, functional aspects of an application now needs to be aware of all these different types of vertical testing because they've got to review the bot output. <laughs> so if a performance issue comes in or a privacy thing comes in, they need to be aware enough to be able to triage and decide if the robot was behaving correctly or not. If not, it's going to be trouble. If you can, again, that looks a lot more like a test manager job um, versus an individual contributor job. 
and uh, and you need to look smart when you're you know you're you're approving or or, or disapproving of the AI's output when it comes back to you know the core team. So here's some user feedback examples. So the cool thing, you know, also at the extreme end, I remember I did this as an exercise to prove that the find the limitations of AI. And ironically, I found that it's the best aspect of AI, which is of Gen AI. Um, and that is look at a web look at a web web page and just uh, you know, like user testing, like this, um, like the you know end user you know panel feedback, right? Is the quality of things like oh, I like the site for this, or it's oh, it's too red, or it's there's just red everywhere, or you know there's not enough information on this page. Like that type of feedback is testers always think is very human and very qualitative and very unique to humans. The irony is that that's that's totally changed. It's not true anymore. Um, like if you look, you look at John in the bottom corner, I just copied this last night or a couple months ago. It says navigating the site was easy, but I would appreciate more detailed product information. And you know what? Yeah, <laughs> it's just a picture of the phone. Um, and like, you know, two sentences of text, like this price, you know, he's got a profile of probably a nerd or an engineer. And, uh, he wants to pick Android phones based on the processor or the memory or whatever. Right. Some more detailed information, and it's not obvious to him where where it is. So you can get that qualitative type of feedback from from generative AI. So the AI can generate users and personas that would match that site, and then give you feedback. And again, the role of the tester here is to to um, instead of you know talk to users or talk to real human users, which is slow and expensive, or talk to an external vendor to get that feedback. You can just get it through AI. It just gives it to you, and then that you can go, okay, yeah, good, bad, um, useful, not useful. Again, it's a triaging kind of management rule. This is actually the, I, I did this last night. This is actually the, the AI feedback on, so this is simulated users uh, for the page and this is their feedback on the on the TestView conference website, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah, generally pretty positive. Um, but one thing that seemed to be a theme, very interesting maybe to the TestView folks is that, is that they wanna see more that there's going to be more networking like on at the conference or during the conference on the on the landing page they want to see that there's going to like networking is probably something they like to do and want to do more of but it's not obvious how to do it or if there is a lot so so about automation engineering so this is if you're an sdet you're you're writing test automation if you're a selenium java person or playwright person um the uh the first thing to notice is that like to get promoted in this world this new world is that Basic coverage is going to be assumed. Like the, no one's going to be impressed anymore that you can write code, right? You used to get excited about that. I learned how to write Java. Um, I want everybody to know I know Java and I want the organization to know I can code. And I'm now a coder and you get all this pride in it. And you get maybe another like 10 or 15K a year. Um, that's gone because actually that looks really easy because everybody can type into to, um, the chat GPT and say, hey, generate a Selenium script for me. And you can change it to whatever language you want or switch the framework right? And it can just generate the code. So that's not impressive to anybody more. So I think there's going to be in near term, some downward pressure on the, on pay scales for, for automation engineers, because it's going to look easy. Um, so, um, and people also expect the organizations will expect that, that with AI, you're sped up. If you keep delivering at the same rate, they'll be like, AI can do that, a lot of this stuff. Why isn't this a lot faster? Right. Um, so that's something to worry about and some we need to focus on. So, uh, one the other thing is people expect faster code fixes, especially engineers that work with AI or generative AI. They know that that bug fixes are super fast and easy, right? So if your test suite is broken in production or in whatever pre-production, your production, um, and it takes you like a day or two to fix the code, they're going to roll their eyes, um, and you're going to be ignored from then on. Uh, but and conversely, you can use, if you have bug fixes, you have flaky tests. Guess what the best thing is? If you're on automation, the best tip ever is just take your code, whatever it is that you think is flaky, and copy paste it into an LLM and say, this test is flaky. How can I make it more robust? And guess what it'll do? It'll make it more robust and less flaky um, in, in most of the cases uh, and in about 10 seconds. Um, so, so that's a real way to get to minimize the, because one of the things that automation engineers always get in trouble is their code, you know, a lot of people automation engineers want to be a developer, let's just be frank, and the development team is watching them, but guess what? If they can't fix their code quickly, they don't want them on the team. 
if their code breaks all the time, they don't want them on the team. So we really use AI to to um, to make to, to make it look like you're sophisticated and you're you're a great coder. Also, last thing is um, the only thing we'll probably really be appreciated in automation engineering soon is, and also realize that the AI is going to do a lot of automation. It will have more test test cases and test results than you will. So you need to focus on um, complexity. So if your stuff, it's very hand wavy because it's very specific to the context you're working in. But if your stuff doesn't look sophisticated, um, you need to make it look sophisticated. Here's a quick example of AI. So these are paths that the AI has tested all on its own, just you know, sequence of, of pages in a test case. So it's created a created the test case and it's executed it and it's verified it all without a human in the loop. So you have to compete with this. And it's and basically people should need to level up, but this is coming. This is real data and happening now. Like it actually can verify that you know, it does a news search, searches for some news that's relevant, looks at the results and make sure there's actually news articles in there that are relevant. Um, usually in verification in software automation is just make sure this element is there, this text is on the screen and you have to know about it ahead of time. Um, so you have to be ahead of that curve. Just for fun, here's some pictures of, of the AI testing the, um, the conference page too. So it looks at the page by itself, figures out what actions a user would want to do, and then verifies that what happened is what the user would have expected. So for management, the big, the big thing to hear is it, you need to be, have increased scope. So if you're a director or test manager or something, um, you'll have this threat from the bottom because now you're, all your individual test reports are, um, well, they're mini test managers, right? They're doing analysis now, they're doing triage. Um, and uh, so you have to figure out how you fit in with that. Um, there's a couple, and also there's a big threat because of smaller teams. So a lot of people are a test manager or a director because they manage five, 10, 20, 50, 100 people. And that's how the titles go up, right? Is the scope of influence and management. Well. You'll need fewer people, generally speaking, um, for for testing in the near future. And so, um, so what do you do? <laughs> you've got to you've got to differentiate some some way else. Like you can imagine, the director gets turned into a test manager. Um, maybe they just never get promoted again. They don't get demoted, but they just never get promoted again because they're acting as a test manager, not a director. Uh, and um, and the people that report to them are acting more like a test manager than them. So. I highly recommend these folks get closer to the business, like understand the business a lot more and the other functional teams. Um, and also there's a big thing too, rather than focus on growing your empire of, and hiring a bunch of people, um, the management will start asking, how are you making the testing better and faster or cheaper and using, using AI? And you'll have to have an answer for that. So growing your team is not the answer to success. Ironically, making that team more efficient is now becoming, uh, is now in vogue. So if you look at this, this is just some some test some, a test summary from the AI. So like the AI bots go out and they do testing, and you can see that um, you know you give it a grade. <laughs> it actually gave it most test managers. You can't even get a, a um, an, an, an um, like an actual number out of them. Um, they'll just mumble and talk for about ten minutes about it about the, what's good and what's bad. And it can also uh, summarize all these test results. It can say here's the best aspects of the page, and here's the worst aspects. Not even the page of the site. Um, so. It can, so the weird thing is that man, test manager has to be able to add, show they have value on top of this type of reporting because the AI will do it. It will do it faster and will be able to understand all the test results um, and it's going to be far less expensive. So the question is how to differentiate as to, to get promoted and um, as a test manager, you need to add value on top of that. And that's why you need to be more closely aligned with the business. Um, and, in, and the easiest thing is just to increase scope. Instead of testing you know, one app, you test four apps. Um, the other big thing that's happening here is that people don't quite realize is that AI means scale. And so, because if, if an AI bot can test your app and do a decent job of it without a human in the loop, now you can just send it off to test the internet. So just like Google crawls the internet um, and indexes it and gives you a search result page, um, uh, stuff. this is what I work on, is um, bots that will, um, just like Google, go out and crawl the internet but instead of indexing the, the keywords and stuff like that and concepts, it actually tests the website. And then instead of search results, it gives you test results. Uh, sounds kind of familiar, right? <laughs> but it's finally unlocked because, uh, because of AI. So, but there's some real benefits of scale. And one is this, most teams cannot test, most test managers can't even test their own app. 
completely, right? Let alone their competitive apps. So if you're Google and you see, oh, I got a B plus, like you might've seen, they go like, ah, Google gets a B plus. Um, but then you realize in context, hey, the AI says DuckDuckGo and Bing are also Bs, right? Um, and by the way, Yahoo sucks, uh, <laughs> it gives it a C. So actually the AI is kind of sensible, um, but, but it puts it in context, right? This is a thing that test managers can't do today, couldn't do today, but they can do um, uh, with, with data from AI. So you can do some comparisons on performance. Uh, another thing you can do is use that data to guide your testing, which testers you hire, where you focus your time on, um, and, and what you communicate back to the org. So you can look across that set of applications, these search apps, and these on the left are the most common types of issues that are found by the AI. But that means that these types of apps have these have issues in these areas. So guess what? You should probably focus on those areas, right? Not even, and communicate back to the engineering and product people that say, hey, we need to really nail these things because it's generally a problem for the type of app we're building. Conversely, on the right-hand side, you can, the AI can say, hey, these are usually not issues, like UI, UX stuff, right? Why is that not a problem in search engines? Because you're kind of simple. It's a search box with a logo and a button. Um, so they generally don't have those problems, they have uh, less uh, complex um, DOMs. So, um, but that's a, a signal to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't overinvest in UI, UX, um, or even browser compatibility because they've got great testing teams generally, but also the, the DOMs are pretty simple. Lastly, you talk about you get benchmarking. So across these human, the human feedback, the simulated human user feedback, you can compare, not, you not just know how your app is doing in terms of like, um, you know, features, like how many features you have versus everyone else and what the users expect, but also like, you know, how is the overall design? Like what's the emotional, even I love this one, what's the emotional connection the user has with your website? It actually doesn't like Google all that much on that, but you can see, how does, how does my app compare with my cohorts? And those cohorts may be competitive apps or they may be other apps inside my company. So the real secret is this, the real secret is get this data. And then, um, uh, uh, then you look like the boss because you can analyze all your other, the, the work of all the other test managers in the, in the company. Um, and uh, so you look like you're in control of all these, the quality of all these apps. And you can focus to show that your apps um, are actually doing better than everybody else's. That, that's, that's a promotion to me. Um, so quick, so you should move quickly to an AI first uh, approach to your career uh, quickly. And if you're, you've already started too late, even if you started a year ago, you probably started too late um, and encourage others to, to use AI. And the reason is you'll look like a leader, right? And it, it will force you to be visible. Um, so an obvious, probably obvious, you know, follow all the AI news, embrace change. A key lesson I learned from my time at Google was, and that wasn't required, but it's a 70, 20, 10 split where you spend 70% of your time on the stuff for now, 20% on the near future and 10% on the far future. So make sure you budget your time every month or every week, break it down like that. And that helps you kind of stay ahead of the curve. So thanks for geeking out. I hope you get promoted. Um, and if you do, let me know. Um, it's actually pretty cool. I'll like it on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, and I'm also, I'm running checky.ai. Um, so the only plug for that is, uh, Go to checky.ai if you want to see those similar test results like that for your um, uh, for your website and your product that you're testing. Um, you can sign up. I can, there's even like there's basically there's basic free results up there where I can get you some uh, to play with. So you can see what real AI is doing uh, test results from from real AI. And also, you know, the funny thing is, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's really a glimpse into the future, and I genuinely think it might actually help you get promoted. So thanks. Great, great, Jason. Thanks for that wonderful session. Uh, we don't have much time, but I do. Uh, I would love uh, if you could answer a couple of questions. We have a lot of questions. Are we're we're talking to a bunch of new test managers and directors here. <laughs> yes, of course. We need to make time for them. So, uh, all right. The first one we have. Oh, so what strategies should testers use to effectively promote their AI testing skills to potential employers? Now we were bound to get uh, this. It's funny. I think it's both positive and negative as LinkedIn. <laughs> people looked at LinkedIn when they're going to hire somebody and they look uh -huh. at what you've been posting. And, you know, I think it's great. People are showing their certifications they're getting in like, you know, for generative AI from NVIDIA <laughs> or Google or something. I think those are, those are great. Um, it shows that you're interested in you. You're learning and making progress over time. The other, the downside is if you say like, hey, AI, I don't believe in AI, 
<laughs> then it's like, like it's probably not going to be helpful in getting your next role. And people wonder whether well, they're very anti AI and, and, and technology. And you wonder why they're struggling to find jobs in this market. I think that, that public presence on social media is actually super important these days. Look at yeah. the resume. Yep. Yep. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Build your brand. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So next to Anna. We have, do you think any kind of testing, even asking silly questions, is good for exploring what are the limitations of an LLM? 100%. My, I don't want to be mis misinterpreted. I, I ask silly questions all the time. I yeah. even put garbage yeah. in there. I copy paste yeah. binary data to see what it's going to do, right? Because I'm a tester. But the only thing is I don't. Right. Oh, oh wow. Look, it gave me a crazy answer when I copy pasted a, um, the raw binary code of a PNG file. Like, it's not exciting or interesting. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think testers also get too distracted with that is there's, there's billions of dollars being spent on building and testing LLMs today. Like your job is not to test the LLM. Right. Go, go work there. Go work at OpenAI. Go work at right. Microsoft um, or, or Meta. Um, but, I, but really think about, about it, testing it, if, in, how it's in your application or how you're applying it for testing purposes. I think find the edge cases there, but not in the core LLMs. That's really, and even when you file, even if you file a bug, they're, they're not going to fix it and they can't fix it. Okay, another one. This is an interesting one. Uh, so what do you think that in future we will have a label that says it was tested by AI similar to generated by AI? Human work will be more expensive and business can choose something in the middle? No. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think AI is going to be pervasive, um, whether people want to admit it or not. Um, yeah. And... Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, ironically, I think the AI products might actually be better is the, the thesis. So yep. why would you do more for something that was worse? Unless you just want to contribute to, if you just want to contribute to humans, I can send you my, mm -hmm. um, my, uh, my, um, you know, my PayPal account. You can just donate money um, or you can support UBI <laughs> and, you know, have the government pay everybody right. a, a basic wage. Uh, but I don't think it, in business, it doesn't make sense at all. I don't think it would. Yep. Last one, and we'll be done. Uh, so what are the key indicators that an AI tool is enhancing your testing efficiency and supporting your career growth? I'm a real fan of How do you want actual to data. It? So if you get promoted, it's probably helping your career growth. Um, and and <laughs> feel free to use your old measures of testing efficiency, like time to release, like number of released right. issues into the production. Um, like use the same metrics that, that you used to use to measure quality and efficiency. Um, and just apply AI and see if it gets better. The key thing, though, is that you need to A-B flight it. <laughs> so if you're a test director um, and soon to be a test director because you know all these secrets now, um, pick one team to do the AI adoption and then see how much better or worse they do mm -hmm. versus other teams. The reality, I think, is also goes back to um, uh, most AI tools. Well, most of the AI stuff is marketing today. It's not real AI. Like uh, right. TestMute demoed some actual real AI this morning, which is cool to see. Um, but most of it's just marketing and, um, and really the value isn't that it's, no, it's not that you need to be adopting AI to figure out how to do that. People are trying to take advantage of that though. But, um, but really it's back to this great question, which is how do you get it to, how do you get it to add value? The cool question is what value does it add to you and your efficiency and your quality of product, um, and, uh, and your speed. Most of it's about speed actually, but really measure, measure it with real metrics. Um, don't just say, I feel like I'm faster or smarter and then tell everybody you're smarter or faster. Right. So I think that's it. We have overshot, but thank you, Jason. And thank you everyone uh, for joining this session. Uh, and everyone who wants to catch this session again or have missed anything, you can get the recording. Uh, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, anyway, thanks for joining us and have a great day ahead. Thanks, Navi. Thank and hey, there's a lot of test directors out there now. <laughs> yes. All the best for you. All right. Cheers. Yeah.